And hello, everybody. Uh, it is really great to be here. I um, studied a uh, horrible mishmash of science and maths and physics and, and um, IT and finance uh, right at a time in the late 90s when suddenly the internet was coming to South Africa and I was really sort of drawn to it. Uh, and, and you could literally watch packets arrive at the mainframe sort of one a second. Remember the old FTP program that actually put like a little hash each time 1,500 bytes arrived? And you could sit there and watch like, wow, that came from America. So, but I was fascinated both by this kind of cool technology, learning about IP and TCP and uh, HTTPS and things like that, but fascinated by the interplay between that and society, right? So I always think that, you know, when we talk about changes in society, it's easy to miss, but they're always driven by changes in technology. Uh, and it's the same with business. Changes in business are almost always uh, driven by changes in what's possible, which is changes in technology. Now, I know you guys are brilliant, so I can't teach you anything about um, uh, robotics or actuators, um, but I, I, I hope I can share some ideas and thoughts about how these disruptions, these incredible changes, um, uh, tear up economics and make new things possible, or Schumpeter's creative destruction, how that works, and how to think about the, the trajectory for your thoughts and your work, whether that's social, you know, how, how you're going to change society, um, because the work that you do will have real consequences, right? The technical brilliance is one thing, but it will have real consequences in society. And also, if you are part of a startup or you want to be part of a startup or you want to be part of a mega corporation, how to think about the business models associated with that. So I, I, I hope we'll, we'll play with some interesting technology. Um, uh, I've had a blast over the last week um, sprinting with the guys from Illa Robotics. Um, and uh, a team from Canonical, uh, some other community folks, looking at um, technology for things, like how we, how we reshape the operating system for things. And the deep thought there really is, how do, we, how do we take what works beautifully in the lab and make that work beautifully in the field, right? Because those are two quite different environments. So there'll be a bunch of stuff there. I'll be down at the command line, and um, almost anything could go wrong. We have flaky wireless networks from flaky software to flaky presenters. So anything could go wrong. Um, hold your breath. Um, so I am inspired by being around people who are both creative and um, rigorous. Do you know, that intersection of science, physics, rigor, and art is amazing. And I think what you guys are doing is exactly that, right? It's the intersection of art uh, and science. So I only have one sort of piece of business advice for anybody, especially people who want to be entrepreneurs. It's, it's this, never chase headlines and never chase ambulances, right? Chasing ambulances is a, is a sort of smear against lawyers in America um, who make money out of other people's misfortune, and it's just a terrible way to be. So you don't do anything that makes money out of other people's misfortune. But chasing headlines is interesting. Um, or never, never to do. Uh, you know, I often hear like, you know, WhatsApp gets bought for $19 billion, and then I get like this stream of proposals and the people saying, we want to be the next WhatsApp. Uh, 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 you can never chase headlines, right? It takes five to 10 years to make an overnight success. And I've seen this every time, you know, the internet exploded and uh, people would say, geez, that internet, you know, like last year it wasn't around and suddenly everybody's got an email address. And I was like, yep, those have been around for 20 years. It, it just does that, right? There's this long period of stuff being cool, and then suddenly stuff is everywhere. And if you're not involved in something, you know, it feels like it just happened overnight. And if you are involved in something, it just feels like it's going to go on forever. But I, I guarantee you, in this room is the next Angry Birds, or the next breakout of something. If you want to be part of that, I promise you, someone in this room is going to do it. Uh, it just feels kind of cranky for a long time before it breaks out. Um, but that means that you have to be thinking five to ten years in advance. You have to be thinking about the changes in what's possible. Um, disruption, in a sense, is much easier than it looks. You know, there's this great story about a flea in a jar. You put a flea in a jar. I've never tried this. It seems cruel to fleas. If you put a flea in a jar with a lid on it, and the flea will jump and jump and jump and hit its head on the lid and eventually just learn not to jump that high. And then you take the lid off, and the flea will never get out of the jar, right? Because it won't jump off. And in a sense, businesses are like that, right? Stuff's not possible. They try it, they fail, they try it, they fail, and so they stop trying, right? And all disruption is, is that the, 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 the narrative, the thread of technology changes what's possible. 
And traditional, big, established businesses often won't try and jump out of their jar, right? But if you're really interested in jumping, right, you'll find a way. And you, if you can find something to land on, on the other side, you've disrupted. So really, it's just thinking about changes in what's possible, right? It's pretty easy to predict what people want. And so, you know, just watch Star Trek. Um, and, and, and then say, like, is that possible now? And if it is, you can disrupt something really, really profoundly. And I've seen a bunch of these disruptions. I just turned 42, so I officially qualified for old fart status. Uh, but there's some benefits to being an old fart, and that is that you've seen some of these things before, right? I saw the web. Think about, if you can remember, think about the, all, all these businesses that used to be completely unstoppable, completely you know, dominant in an industry that just died between 1995 and 2005, right? Just because they weren't part of that disruption. A disruption is, you know, generally things are pretty incremental, you know? Everything next year is 5% more than, than, than last year. But then you get a disruption, and on the other side of that, anything can be. It's like an earthquake, right? There's a bunch of buildings that just disappear in, in a very short period of time, and that creates space for new buildings to be built. Uh, we saw that with the web, very much. We saw that with mobile. Again, a bunch of web companies disappeared just because they didn't catch the mobile uh, um, wave. Uh, I think we'll see the same thing now with connected devices, with, with bringing data and intelligence to the ambient world, right? Everywhere around us. And I think that's going to be an invisible but profound disruption. It's not your disruption, though, because you need another miracle. The HP guys have this great expression that for any product, you should only have one miracle, right? Uh, two miracles, and it's a science project. Uh, but one miracle is doable in any given pro uh, a product. And, and so I think you guys need two miracles, right? We need to get the Internet of Things story really amazing. And then uh, we, we make those things truly mobile and dynamic. Um, and then, you know, AI. So I think your, your moment is approaching. I really do. And so it's a great privilege to be right here in the thick of you and get to hang out with you for the weekend and, and chat about some interesting stuff. Right, this of course, this of course is a, rub a rubbish bin, a trash can, depending on your nationality. Um, let me tell you a story. I, I was hanging out with a guy called Tim Chen, uh, and Tim is a lovely, wonderful, funny guy. He is, you know, the progeny of the progeny of the progeny of one of Taiwan's five big technology families. You go back to the sort of 70s, 80s, and there were these five families in Taiwan that basically set up the technology industry. So today, that's like, I think, Asus and Quanta and so on. But the VIA, if you, if you know VIA, the company, that's Tim Chen's family. And so I think he's second or third generation, you know, CEO of, of this company. And he was saying, Mark, you know, <coughs> you know, just as I was graduating college and so on, I thought I'd done really well because the family picked me to, to run the business, right? The technology business. He says, and my, my brother, he went off to, to make dustbins. He says, do you know what I'm starting to realize? He says, do you know what the margins are on dustbins? 50%. He said, do you know what? I'm, I'm trying to sell 9 billion transistors for 12 cents, right? And there's something to think about, right? Uh, if, you, if you start to think about the commercialization of your, of your attitude, of, of, your, of your idea, margin, value, will often not be in the place that you think it's going to be, right? And that's particularly true around hardware, right? If you, if you, if you think about physical things, um, and if your business is going to be, there's a thing, right? And we, people are going to buy the thing, the dustbin. You'd be surprised at what has great margins and what doesn't. Uh, in technology, it's extremely difficult to make a product, a physical product, just a physical product, with very high margins. Extremely difficult, just because the manufacturing process is so competitive, um, and, and many of you will, in fact, be so far from the manufacturing process that it's really hard to get that right. Um, so I would, I would caution you, if you're going to get into physical things, if that's your thinking, um, to really think about who the buyer is going to be. Right? There's this great analysis of margins on different cars, depending on whether the buyer of the car is, is um, um, the husband or the wife. And believe it or not, that makes a difference to the margin on the car. Um, uh, there are cases, of course, where you, you're able to create margins on, on, on hardware. Um, but 
Ultimately, I think if you focus on hardware, you're at risk, pure hardware, you're at risk of creating landfall, right? Like you're just feeding this, this consumer thing where we make stuff and then throw it away. Because hardware on its own, I think, is, is becoming disposable. Um, so how do you go beyond that? Well, obviously, software. Uh, and the great example of this, I think, um, you know, the, the classic example of this is Cisco, right? Uh, the metal in the tin. You can buy exactly the same metal in the tin from another manufacturer, and that other manufacturer will make 5 to 10% profit on the metal, on the chips and the, the box. What do you think Cisco's margins are on a Cisco switch? 65%. And the reason for that is straightforward. It's Cisco works better with Cisco. So if you bought a bunch of Cisco, then you're going to go buy more Cisco, right? So that's the classic kind of razors and blades strategy, right? That, that if you can get people to, 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 to need things that work well together and need guarantees around that, then that drives up margins. I don't think it's a great business model. It's getting very difficult because of open standards, which I think are exactly right, right? So we're learning that we want to make open standards. You want to be able to buy parts from different people and plug them in and have them work. So I think you know, Cisco is a classic example, but it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a historical one. A more interesting approach is to say, well, um, let's take the hardware and add software to create an ecosystem. Right? And the classic examples there would be um, uh, app stores. Uh, and so that's a fairly straightforward way to say, how do I, how do I take a piece of hardware? I know I'm not going to make much margin on that, but what I really want is I want to attract people to create around that. And I like that, I like that a lot more as a sort of modern business model, obviously, because it's, it's, it, it builds on open standards, right? It, it uses the way things are moving in a very creative way. And so um, I, I brought along a guest um, to show you a taste of what that might look like in the age of robotics. Uh, and so this is the Erla spider. And that is a robot running ROS uh, with an app store. Um, and she <laughs> she uh, wants to do your bidding. So let's, 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 let's have a look um, at this robot. Now, I'm talking about app stores. Now, the, the tricky thing with app stores, of course, is that you, you're adding and removing software to a live device. And if you think about what you do in the labs and the way you work with software and the experience of that, you know, apt get install, yum install, um, and the expertise required for that, uh, it would be challenging to imagine end users saying, oh, I just can't wait to apt get dist upgrade um, my uh, thing of one form or another. So, we spend a lot of time working with um, people who were doing stuff in this lab and starting to stress about what this thing was going to feel like when it was in the field. And we realized that to get there, we were going to have to essentially tear up the rule book, rule book and basically jump out of the jar, out of our own jar. Because people say, you know, what's great about Ubuntu uh, or any Linux distribution is I can just app get anything, right? I can app get the world. Uh, and that's cool. Or I can go to GitHub and build stuff, right? And that's cool too. Um, and so we celebrate those things, but in order to get out of the lab and into the field, we're going to have to basically completely tear that up because those tools, building from source on the device, or app get and depackage configure and so on on the device, are just not going to go from the lab to a billion devices in the field, right? So we thought, how can we completely recraft Ubuntu to meet that test? And the cool thing is, there's a whole bunch of new technology in the kernel that, that we lead around containers. Uh, there's a bunch of new ways of thinking about security, cryptography, uh, and, and, the, and, and the validation of software. And what we did is we um, took all the same libraries that make up Ubuntu, and we said, let's recraft them in this new way. And that's um, Ubuntu Core. And the, the first thing you'll notice about Ubuntu Core um, is that nothing works. Um, um, I should be SSH'd into her. Wakey, wakey.
you wouldn't believe the chain of carrier pigeon smoke signals that are connecting this laptop to uh, her. So, um, AppGet doesn't work. And why does AppGet not work? Because we've essentially changed the packaging system so that we can guarantee updates and removes with no configuration. We can guarantee the complete isolation of one application from another application from the operating system. And that means that any individual player, you, or someone who's making an app for you, or Canonical, who's updating Ubuntu, we can each go as fast as we want to go without having to negotiate about anything, right? So there's no interlock. Um, so snappy it is, right? Snappy list. Let's see what's, in, what's installed here. And what you'll see is a, can you read that? You'll see a list of new style packages. We call them snaps. Uh, and obviously, there's Ubuntu Core. That's the operating system. Paste bin it. You can see someone's been trying to cut and paste stuff from, uh, from this lady. Um, say, tweet the spider, webdm, pi2. That's all kind of cool. Um, uh, let me show you. So, so can you make her go forward and back? Just so we can check that she works. So we have, this is Victor. Victor? My very glamorous assistant. Um, so let's see. There we go. She's awake. All right. And um, all of that's being controlled by. Is it Tweet the Spider? Victor? Tweet the Spider is the, is the snap that's the brain, right? OK. So it's called Tweet the Spider for a reason because there's a magic tweet that allows you to make her go forward or backwards. And Victor's going to keep her on the table. So this is going to be a fun exercise. <laughs> Decided not to tell you what the magic tweet for turn left or turn right was, because we don't have many options uh, in, in this regard. Um, right, so um, she's a live running robot. And without turning her off, I want to update the software. So let's have a look here. Hmm. I don't know how many countries these packets are going through. How many intelligence agencies are scratching their heads. <laughs> ah, so she's, normally what she does is she just looks at her local package cache. But because I asked for updates, she's going out to the store to say, um, is there anything new for me? Is there anything new for you? While we're doing that. So the idea is to take your device and open it up. Open it up to other people's magic, other people's innovation, right? The idea is that the, the more people, you, you know the benefits of collaboration around your own code. Imagine you could get this kind of collaboration around your device. But even better, imagine you could get this kind of collaboration around ROS, right? So that there could be um, ROS apps written for ROS robots without actually having to make the ROS robots, right? We see every time we decouple the device from the software, from the creativity, we get this explosion in ecosystems. And so you get an, an app store type ecosystem format uh, uh, creating. OK, so it looks like there's an update. That say application over there has an update. So while she has quite a big update. So while she's, um, yeah, while she's working, let's just do that update. I didn't expect SSH to be the tricky part of this demo. It might be the, the Wi-Fi, as someone said, yeah. But we'll take our chances. Anyway, so what I want to do is just do a live upgrade. So I, I have complete confidence in the system, because it's put together, that I can just do an update, and it will come. And it's not going to affect the operation of the robot, right? And the reason it won't affect the operations of the robot is because of the way we've pulled everything um, apart, right? So these apps can be updated completely independent of each other. They cannot write to each other's files. So um, this app can't break this app. There's no way it can get there. There's no chance of that happening. So that's what we had to do, part of what we had to do in the operating system. The other thing we found is talking to people um, is that folks are saying, look, 
I've got the world of source code at my fingertips, but I've also got a world of pain every time I try and build it. I've got to track all these different versions, I've got to organize it, I've got to understand all these different software projects, build systems, every different kind of major body of con content has its own build system. Roz has Capkin, uh, the, the Node.js guys of NPM, the Ruby guys have, you know, Gems, Python guys have PyPy, uh, there are Auto Tools projects, Make projects, CMake projects, Scons projects. You know, I have to become an expert in all of those things, effectively, to be able to assemble software. And of course, we'd never really thought about that because AppGet is so great. But it's only great if the software that you need is already packaged, right? And it turns out that when you're going as fast as robotics is going, it's all source code, right? It's on GitHub or it's on uh, a, a variety of different places. So let's go in and, and have a look over here. So I want to show you uh, that, that build happened. Let me clean it. Oh, I'm not sure about the Wi-Fi now. Um, well, why not? Um, so we looked at what people were doing, and essentially what people are doing is following recipes, right? So Roz has its set of recipes, uh, inspired, you know, Catkin, effectively, uh, and every different source code project out there has different build systems, different approaches. We didn't want to build a new build system, right? That should get a round of applause, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> What we wanted to do was, a, what we want to build was a meta build system, right? We wanted to say, look, I should be able to describe a project, right? And say, that uses this build system, build it, right? I just want to grab that thing over there that uses make. I want to grab that thing over there from Roz. I want to grab this thing over here, which uses scones. I want to grab something else, very high level, and then it should just do what it needs to do, right? And that turned out to be really quite fun. So here is my personal project. Um, which is this, um, which if I'm stopped at US Customs, I'm going to have to describe as half a precision guided missile. It is, it is in fact, or half a bomb, <laughs> um, because it's a clock. So it's a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yeah, you know that story, right? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so, so it's a Raspberry Pi with a GPS hat on it. Um, and what I'm making is a uh, I'm basically just combi combining two pieces of software, free software, GPSD from Eric Raymond uh, and NTP. And so, um, I, oh, let me just make that font work a bit better. You see that? Um, so all I'm doing is I'm basically saying, I've got a project out there, GPSD. Or well, this is a project, TimeSync, ha -ha, um, which is uh, made of two parts. And the one part is GPSD, which is a SCONS project. Yeah. And here's the source, and what that source is a tarball. Uh, and these are packages you should have installed before you build that thing. Uh, and then this one over here is NTP, which uses auto tools. And there's the source there. Oh, I didn't mean to click on that. Um, and so if I just say Snapcraft build, it goes and fetches the source, it installs all the packages, it does everything I need to do. So the idea is to create these really lightweight descriptions, which can be shared really quickly, of useful stuff out there that's before packaging, BP, right? Before it shows up in app get. And people can pass those things around, it's like five lines of YAML, and you will have GPSD in your project, right? It'll build everything in a project tree, put it there so that you can, you can use it for, for your brain. And that'll go off and do its thing. Um, here's another little project. And this one is a ROS project. So this is gonna use a Catkin plugin. Right? So this is a plugin for Snapcraft that understands Catkin and how Catkin behaves. And all I have to do is say, look, I want these Catkin packages, and then these packages, other packages have to be installed beforehand. So let's go build that. Right. So I'm running these two independent builds in different trees. And literally all I would do is just uh, git clone a tree and Snapcraft. And it doesn't matter what that's pulling in, right? If that's pulling in make stuff, if that's pulling in roll stuff, if that's pulling something else, there's, it's a meta build system, right? So just have to has, just, just to describe what's out there and pull it all together um, and build it. And it'll fetch its own set of packages, get everything, oof, get everything in place. <laughs> Thanks for the beta software, guys. <laughs> um, Right, so that's all cool. <laughs> here is the here is the Rose Catkin, sorry, 
Captain Ross Snapcraft description that built this brain last night. There's no way in hell I'm going to build it this morning. Um, but that's the description essentially to build a Ros package, right? And so you can say, I want all the stuff from Ros, I want that as one part, then I want GPSD, I want that as another part, and, and when you're done, you'll have all of that code built in a single tree, ready to go, ready to stick on your spider. Okay, so there is some software. How's the networking do? Okay, there is some software um, uh, in, in that brain which is listening to Twitter. And so we're going we're gonna to use her to, to, do, to test some polls to get a sense of your guys' feeling on some important topics in robotics. Um, and so the first of those topics is which is going to come to consumer first? Autonomous driving, get in the car, no driver, off you go, or autonomous flying. And so if you wouldn't mind, if you could make her go forwards or backwards, depending on your views on that issue. Um, and we have, a nice, we have a nice exercise here where we can really easily see what you think. Just which way is forwards? Forwards this way. Okay. So forwards is to Victor. Let's see if we can get her going. Right. So I talked about software as a way to basically transform some hardware into something much more interesting, something much more valuable, something that um, uh, you can build ecosystems around, and some of the stuff we're doing to make that really easy, right, in terms of... Um, uh, oh, that's, that's going to be fun, just to remind you. Um, so one of the key things about software is that you're shifting the relationship of people towards paying for what they're actually interested in, right? And you're creating more things that they can be interested in. And environmentally, I think there's a beautiful story about software, which is that it makes hardware useful for longer, right? I don't like filling up landfills. And so one of the beautiful things about software is that something has many more uses. It tends to get used for much longer. It can be updated. It gets more interesting. We keep... I think we've answered that question. <laughs> We keep, um, we keep the hardware for longer because we can make it more useful through software. Um, but there's a way to go even further. <laughs> oh, it's a battle. There's a way to go even further, right? Um, and that is to shift towards services, right? And services really align your interests with those of your users, right? So what do I mean by services? I mean, forget the software, make the software free, right? But then essentially engage with people on a daily basis. And this is really where the world you know, is, is headed. Because if you can essentially um, offer value to people every day, uh, and there's a whole... <laughs> Someone was going to figure it out. <laughs> You're so twisted. Right. So the thing about services is... The thing about services is... Um, for you to be making money, your customer has to be continuing to love and use the device, right? And that's really important. I think it's really healthy for both parts. But it also means that you have a real interest in how that thing behaves in the field, right? A key part about services business is the economics. Every month, you'll be spending money essentially to service everything that's out there. Every month, you'll be earning money, right, based on delivering value to those things. And those two halves have to balance out, otherwise things get ugly quickly. Um, but the cool thing about that is, um, um, so what that means is you want to be able to service something remotely. I mean, there's probably a Wi-Fi base station up top here behind there, right? It's really expensive to go and fix that manually. The telcos talk about rolling a truck. It costs them a fortune to roll a truck, right? If they've got a device somewhere in somebody's premises that's broken and they have to roll a truck, that's really expensive. It'll completely kill your business. So that's why we've, that's why we've, what's that? Yeah, that over there. You need a ladder and a guy with a health and, with a high-vis vest to change that, right? And high-vis vests are very expensive. So um, um, you really want to care about how field serviceable that is. That's why we put so much effort into that transactional update and rollback. And that's, this is what that looks like, the, the, the Ubuntu core, the snappy approach. So in a traditional operating system, right, you've got a big file system and root can write anywhere, 
right? So when you install packages, you're running stuff as root, and those packages can sort of go everywhere, right? So you install the first package, and it's wonderful. You install the second package, things are great. But then you start to install packages that need to share files. And of course, now you create a burden on the user to administer and mediate those choices and fix them if something changes, right? So what do we do with Snappy? We said, okay, let's pull apart all of those pieces. Let's put all the code into signed binary blobs so that they can't be tampered with, right? You'll know immediately if someone's um, messing with the software. And we give each of those binary pieces their own spaces to write stuff like configuration or data and things like that. And we use the kernel containment mechanisms, right? The same stuff that we built that Docker builds on to, to essentially keep those pieces apart, right? And so snaps, each of these, these big dark pieces, that's a snap. And you can have, there's an OS snap that we make and you can have app snaps that you make. And those each get their own writable space. They can't pollute each other's space, right? So you get these writable spaces. Okay, so the next big question, profound question in robotics. Have we flushed the queue? The next big question is, are we going anthropomorphic? <laughs> go, 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 R2D2. Um, so, are we, are we going anthropomorphic or are we going functional? So it's a, I'm interested in what you think, right? It, are the winning robots ultimately going to be form follows function, right? And they'll take the shapes, right, necessary to be really great for a particular thing? Or are they going to be general purpose, right? And probably anthropomorphic, right? Do you think we will have autonomous things that work the way we do or things that work completely differently because that's more functional? Oof. Okay, functional seems to be winning that one. Okay, so a new business mo model that people are wrapping on top of services is data, right? This idea that the money is in the data. Uh, and I think that's actually going to turn out to be, for ma in many cases, something of a red herring, uh, especially for small startups, right? And the reason for that is that data can also be a liability, right? There's a, there's a current trend where the sort of business model is, the v, you tell the VCs, oh, we're going to gather all of this data. The problem is, you're going to get hacked, right? And so you really have to account for that. Just like with the services business model, you have to say, I really have to think about how expensive it's going to be for me to manage a million of these things when some of them are in outer Mongolia, right? With the data models, you have to say, okay, there's a, I have to essentially put a cost on all the data that I own. It's not free, right? It's like the rainforest, right? We should put a price on it. Because there's a risk there when you're managing other people's data. It's a real responsibility, and it can be challenging. Um, security of all forms can be even more difficult, right? Just this week, um, uh, D-Link makes a lot of things, published the cryptographic keys that they use to sign the software for said things. So now you and anybody else can write Windows drivers for D-Link stuff. And, um, and that can do anything in the Windows kernel. So that's pretty scary, right? Um, and the reason I point this out, there's another one just this week, right? This is beautiful, right? There's a whole bunch of Linux devices out there that have got like some sort of built Yocto, whatever, on the day image that's like riddled with holes. And now there's a battle of malware. You've got malware going in there to turn those things into spam bots, and some kind soul has written another kind of mal malware to go in there and clear out all the other kind of malware. So we've got this like IoT mal malware Game of Thrones going on <laughs> between, between <laughs> notionally good, by, good guys and bad guys. I think the good guys are just sort of cleaning up so that they can own those things properly themselves. Um, and so this is why we put so much effort into, again, into the security primitives of Ubuntu Core, right? to be able to say, first, you've got to keep these apps completely contained. So if one app gets compromised, right, not only can it not go and write to another app space or read from another app space, but the, um, anything that, that compromises it, has only compromised it, can't jump out of that container effectively and go and compromise something somewhere else. Right? And this is the stuff, trust me, in the lab, you really don't need to be thinking about, right? What you want to be doing is focusing on the, on the stuff that's going to make your stuff great, right? Not on the kind of housekeeping, right? Otherwise, you end up like having something great with really bad housekeeping, right? So 
by containing and isolating all of the applications, we essentially minimize the risk of a compromise. There will be compromises, right? But we've got to contain those, minimize those, plus the update mechanism allows us to fix them, right? And that's incredibly valuable for anything that's gone from the lab into, into the world. Okay, and so our final test of your opinions and your views on acceptable business models. Right. <laughs> I believe it's illegal in some states. So. Um, right, so only a question half in jest, right? Because, again, people often think about business models and they think about the places where you have huge amounts of money, you know, like defense. It's a horrible place to do business, right? Or huge organizations, huge companies, you know, Boeing, right? Really tough to build up the sort of relationship to work with those very large institutions. If you're inside those institutions and you're passionate about this stuff, you're going to go super fast, right? Because this stuff is so hot. Your companies want the stuff to fly, literally. And so if you've got the tools and the, and the, and the, and the insights and the skills, you're going to go, you know, ballistic. But if you're outside of those organizations, as a small organization, it's just incredibly difficult to connect to them. Things like that DARPA project are enormously valuable because they essentially find efficient ways to connect um, small, brilliant ideas with no track record with those large institutions that are all about track record, right? And track record's expensive and takes time. By the time you have a track record, this disruption and opportunity will be done, right? So you, you, you really have to think about that. And the reason this is interesting is because you should never under, underestimate, right, entertainment as a business, right? If you look at, if you look at how people, you know, look at the web and what won the web, cat videos, right, um, porn. Um, entertainment is an enormously important kind of field of commerce. And I think a lot of the stuff that's in the labs today is going to show up first as entertainment, right? Fun, family, you know, stuff to do with the family. People, you know, there's an enormous pressure on people's time, and so they're willing to spend money, right, for, to, to engage and to have fun doing new things. So I'm very excited about um, some work that one of our teams is doing with organizations focused on the Internet of Toys. Right? Internet of Things seems kind of impersonal, but I love the idea of the Internet of Toys, right? First, creating a new generation of inventors, right? Because think about what you can invent if you don't have to make the thing, right? Come back to that App Store idea, right? And we can make every, every um, you know, bright kid be an inventor and a roboticist if we can essentially give them that platform. ROS is a huge step in that direction. But if we come up a level, right, and say, just assume that you have a robot that can do amazing things, now what can you dream with that? And how much fun can you have with that? So I'm super excited about uh, work that Canonical's doing around the Internet of Toys, right? Because I think play is a great way to learn, and play is a great way to invent. Ultimately, for all of you guys, um, whether you are going to stay in the labs, you know, whether your, your mission in life is to, is to invent the perfect way to do something uh, in software or hardware, or whether your mission in life is to build amazing products, or whether your mission, mission in life is to build an amazing business, what's going to be key for you is your ability to focus. And so one of the things I hope, you know, one of the great privileges that I have is to is to make platforms that allow people to focus on the stuff that they really want to do differently, right? Just in the last 10 years, the list of things that people have built on Ubuntu is incredible because they could just say, well, that's going to be there. I'm going to focus on the stuff that I need to do, right? Uber, um, Spotify, Instagram. Um, and the way that happened is that always what we've done is we've said, okay, there's a special crowd of people that are kind of like artists, scientists, crazy people, and they're always trying to make very difficult things work. And 12 years ago, that was Linux, right? Like, Linux is really, really difficult. So we said, fine, let's hire a bunch of guys and we'll make Linux for human beings. Linux that anybody can get access to, right? There's no economic barrier to getting access to it. There's no usability barrier to getting access to it. So we just unleash your imagination, right? 
Then, sort of five years later, we noticed that this special crowd of people were trying to make Linux work in VMs that had like dynamic host names that were only around for an hour. And it turned out that there was just like a world of paper cuts because Linux, all of our Linuxes, had been built to be installed once and last 10 years, right? Not to be installed 500 times and last 10 minutes, right? And so we had to go through Ubuntu and make a whole bunch of changes, right? Small things, lots of kind of tweaks and assumptions cleared out and so on, just to make it super easy. We always say, give me a machine on Amazon and, and I go. And we unleashed this fantastic creativity on the cloud. It was, people were going to do great stuff on the cloud anyway, right? But we made it go faster just by taking care of all of that housework. And today, it's this. Today, this is what I see, right? That same crowd of people, right? They're tinkering, soldering, putting stuff together. Uh, and again, there's this huge world of paper cuts, right? Uh, cryptographic keys, updates, SSH, flaky networks. And um, if we can make that all disappear, right? So that you can focus on just grabbing some hardware, grab, grab some stuff, ROS, and apps, right? We'll, I think we'll unleash the same kind of creativity for you and for a million other people who want to, who want to build on the stuff that you are building, stand on your great shoulders. Uh, and to do that, we have to allow you to focus. Um, it's always a bit of a kind of exploration, right? So what I want this weekend, what I really hope to get this weekend, is just to listen to all of your problems, right? Like, what's difficult? What do you love? What's easy? What would you like to make easy? Because that's what we do. That's the, that's the core story uh, of Ubuntu. And I think, well, nobody has an opinion of the question of the day, clearly. <laughs> and I think that's it. Brian, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Questions? Yes, one in the back. Right. So, yeah, sure. So I think the question is about, you know, how do we support validation and integrity and continuous integration type processes, both in the lab, like in the, in the build process, and in the field. So one of the key ideas of uh, Snappy is that that most of your dependencies will be bundled with your software, right? So it's a huge departure from the traditional approach, right? And the traditional approach is really great if you're, if you're in the lab and you, and you can fix those dependencies. Um, it's really efficient, there's lots of security benefits to it and so on. But when you ship a product, right, you're gonna take responsibility for the security of that device, not your users. And so you bundle all of your dependencies. So one of the, the things that we do is we say, look, you're gonna bring your own Python, you're gonna bring your own Java, you're gonna bring your own that tree of libraries. There is a set of libraries the system provides, and if you want to use that, that's great, but we totally understand if you want to shrink wrap the whole lot, which allows you to do a test process, which is awesome, right? Which is, you're knowing exactly what bits for your app are gonna land on the device. Instead of having like 2,000 packages on a system, you're gonna have like five, right? And so the number of dependencies and moving parts is greatly, greatly reduced. So that's one of the things. The other thing is that in your snap, you can, and, and I'm describing 16.04, but in your snap, you can uh, include two health tests. So basically like a smoke test. You can say a static test, which is like, is this, would, should this app start, basically? You can look at, and that script, you provide that script or, or, or hook. That can look at data. It can say, look, my database is there. The data is all well structured. The configuration is great, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thumbs up. Um, and a running test, which is, is, is everything that should be running, running, and does it appear to be responding well. So you provide those. And so Snappy can do automatic updates, right? You can publish an update, and we will canary it out across a million devices, like 1%, then 5%, then 10%. And they update, run those health checks in the field, and if there's a problem, we backed up all the data, right? If there's a problem, we do a transactional rollback. We go back to the previous version, the software, the previous version, the data, no change. So it's really designed to be on Rails, right? You, you write the tests, and, and that update process, the health check there, will be as good as the tests. And we know how that works, right? The tests are not very good initially, and then they get better and better as people 
you know, learn to take, take, get confident and take advantage of that. Does that answer your question? Hey, I wasn't going to be that narrow-minded. You, you, <laughs> you don't have to repeat that for the video page. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Mark. Ah, and just one last comment. That spider is on Indiegogo. So yep. if you feel a need, go to Indiegogo. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks.